YouTube is reportedly considering major changes to its platform that would move all the videos aimed at kids to the YouTube Kids app. The potential move comes amid calls for YouTube to better protect young viewers from accessing objectionable content. And there is also, of course, an ongoing debate about how the platform should police extremist content following controversy over YouTube's decision to demonetize conservative commentator Steve Crowder over allegations of bullying. Here to discuss both of these issues is host of The David Pakman Show, David Pakman himself. His program also was demonetized in the wake of changes to YouTube uh, back. When was that, David, that that happened? That was April 2017. Yeah, so a little while ago. So, uh, David, thanks so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. So just give us a little bit of your view of how YouTube should be handling um, the proliferation of extremist content on the platform. Well, listen, there's sort of a two standards that I think we need to apply here. There's one of monetization and there's other of content being allowed on the platform. And I think that that's being lost in a lot of the conversations that yeah. uh, start to talk about things like free speech and censorship. It's really important to understand that there's no sort of inherent right to monetization, uh, never mind to publish content on YouTube. My personal view is I want as much speech as possible and short of illegal content, uh, that content should be allowed on the platform. The question of whether advertisers should be forced to or expected to advertise on content they or their customers might find objectionable, though, is, is a different one. And monetization is a different sort of standard than the content itself being allowed. Yeah, people well, don't have a right yeah. to add roles. Right. You know? <laughs> like... That's exactly right. And a lot of the questions around this are, are focused on monetization when the arguments being made seem to apply more to whether the content itself should be allowed. And it's really important to distinguish what it is that we're talking about. Yeah. David, another thing I've seen the criticism of is, OK, maybe he doesn't. Uh, maybe he doesn't deserve ads on his platform, Steven Crowder. But it's the haphazard way in which these changes and these things go about. I heard you talk a little bit about this on the Joe Rogan podcast. Just outline for us what you think a comprehensive solution that YouTube might be able to take. Because you said, as you outlined yourself, one day you just woke up and there were significant changes to, to your own channel. Yeah, I mean, it's important to understand that the idea of uh, uh, someone deserves monetization is an extraordinarily strange argument to make when we're talking about a company, Google and YouTube, that has terms of service and should be allowed to apply them. I think my concern is the uneven application of some of these policies, and it seems to often be very much directed by what creates a public outcry or discussion in the media when there is tons of content just by virtue of how many hours of stuff is uploaded to YouTube every minute. There's tons of content that is arguably not legal content and or certainly not brand safe that never even makes any headlines because nobody's watching it. And so my concern is, is the policy being applied evenly and fairly? Of course, YouTube is allowed to have terms of service and enforce them, assuming they don't violate non-discrimination laws or whatever else may be sort of the legal uh, status quo. But we've got to apply it uh, equally across the board. We had a number of recent incidents where um, people who took or attempted to take violent actions um, had a history of basically YouTube radicalization. There's been a lot of written about this recently. I mean, to me, the problem with YouTube seems sort of more fundamental than we're going to block this person, we're going to demonetize right. that person, which is that the algorithm itself, at least up to this point, has promoted this kind of path to extremism. Well, I think it's interesting what you what you mentioned because all of these platforms are fundamentally designed to increase watch time on the basis of you watched video A, what videos B, C, and D can the algorithm show you that are most likely to keep you watching as long as possible? And in the same way that a lot of people we've now learned have been radicalized by these echo chambers that are created, I also am hearing from viewers who have been deprogrammed from radical right-wing thinking because of that same uh, algorithm where they went from right-wing extremist content to someone who's debating right-wing extremist content oh, uh -huh. to something like me. So I think there's examples of all of this stuff, but there's yeah. no question that the algorithm is amoral in the sense that all it wants to do is keep you watching or consuming content for as long as possible. That's an excellent point, David. But the reason that we have you is because you're a progressive YouTube star. And I would love your take on the current state of the Democratic primary, particularly what we're dealing with here in Washington, which is the fallout from Joe Biden's comments on on uh, comparing waxing nostalgic for working with segregationists while he was in Congress. 
Is how is it that progressives are going to have to reconcile themselves if Joe Biden will become the nominee if we're 17 months out and he's already doing stuff like this? Well, uh, there's a couple of different things there. One, there's not that much reconciliation to do right now. Right now, it's which candidate most aligns with your values and who uh, is presenting po policy positions that are most in line with what you want to see. And that's that's who you support. I mean, we haven't even had the first debate. We're already seeing that Joe Biden has been pretty significantly trailing off from, I think he spiked to around 42% in the polls after he announced he was running. He, he's down almost 10 points now, and it's been mostly Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren that have been uh, sort of picking up uh, on those declines from Joe Biden. So I think that in the, in the end, uh, most progressives would agree that basically every option right now uh, running on the Democratic side would be a, a better alternative to Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. But that's a conversation for at least we've after we've had a couple debates right now, it's support who you most believe in. It's interesting that you say that Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders are picking up that support from Joe Biden. I've certainly seen that with Warren. She seems to be rising in the polls, pulling into second in some. But what's, what are you seeing in terms of Bernie Sanders that would justify that comment? Uh, well, so in the last five or so days, Bernie Sanders has declined a little bit in the polls and Elizabeth Warren has gained. But if you go back to the uh, sort of four weeks following Joe Biden's original announcement, you can actually track almost every point that Joe Biden lost was picked up by Bernie Sanders, like 80 percent, with the other 20 percent going to other candidates. Um, so I think just if you look at, you know, the real clear politics polling average, you'll see that Bernie Sanders gain mirrored Joe Biden's decline up until about five five or seven days ago, at which point it's been Elizabeth Warren that's been gaining. So a tactical question for you, David, something I've been asking a lot of the progressives on this show, which is that Elizabeth Warren has branded herself. She says, I'm a capitalist, but I'm for an economic patriotism plan, much of the same proposals that would come in practice with a Bernie Sanders. However, Crystal and I were actually at that rally where Bernie Sanders embraced the Democratic Socialist label saying no matter what they do, they're going to call you a socialist and I am a Democratic Socialist. Was it tactically, was it tactically better for Elizabeth Warren to call herself an economic patriot, wrap herself in language familiar to the normal American who isn't maybe afraid of socialism than it was for Bernie Sanders to embrace the socialist label? I'm less sure about whether what Elizabeth Warren did was correct than I am sure that what Bernie Sanders is doing is counterproductive. And I've been talking about this on my program. I mean, I voted for Bernie in the 2016 primary. And even in 2015, I was saying his policies are not socialist policies. They are socially democratic policies in the line of the Nordic economies. And it is counterproductive, particularly when socialist is a smear uh, that is very um, uh, 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 well used by many on the right in the United States, there's no reason to be doing this sort of self-inflicted damage. And I understand the argument. If either way they're going to call a socialist, why not embrace the label? The reason not to embrace, embrace the label is that social democracy is capitalism. It's well-regulated capitalism, not socialism. And I do think that it's a st strategic and tactical mistake. I mean, that is a... a a funny thing is that he he is not a socialist, right? right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. He may be. I mean, here's the thing: he may be a socialist, and Elizabeth Warren is a capitalist. But on policy, they've come very very close. I mean, Elizabeth right. Warren's approach is to work a little bit more within the structure and tweak it, whereas Bernie's approach is to change that structure. But even if they in the 70s, one came from a capitalist side and one came from an actual socialist side, they're platform and policy today is social democracy, and right. I think that's how it should be branded. Well, and it's mainstream. I mean, right. Bernie Sanders' platform within the Democratic Party is at this point fairly mainstream. I think my take is a little bit different. I think it'd be very hard for him to try to embrace a different label at this point when he has like 40 years of calling himself Democratic Socialist. So I think probably the calculus is, this is who you are, this is what you've been calling yourself, let's try to make it more comfortable for people and situate it within an American context. Um, that may be, that may be. It's just not accurate. And I think that at a certain point, we should be calling things what they are. And single payer health care and using taxation of financial transactions that add no value to the economy to make sure that nobody is left behind at the bottom, that's social democracy. That's Sweden, Norway, uh, Denmark, et cetera. And I think we should just call things what they are. Yeah, that's an interesting. Uh, I think this is this is really one of the core fights that was going to come down to if there is an alternative to Joe Biden 
in the Democratic primary. But I'm also intrigued by, I mean, the rise of Pete Buttigieg as kind of a alternative to Joe Biden for mm -hmm. much of the neoliberal the elite. Type. What is it that you think, what is it about him that, that progressives have, have been very suspect of him despite so much of this embrace from the media? Uh, some progressives have been suspect of him, some have not. I mean, I think that what Pete Buttigieg has, has going for him is that he is uh, extremely articulate in presenting what are, in practice, very similar views to Joe Biden. So whereas Joe Biden has been relatively gaff-prone uh, and, and maybe putting the least favorable spin on some of his ideas, Pete Buttigieg is sort of the opposite. But it's coming at the expense of depth because when I see Pete Buttigieg speak, I'm, I'm, under, I'm interpreting that a lot a lot of the policies are similar to those of Joe Biden, but they are sort of lacking in detail. And ultimately, when the debates actually start, that may be something that hurts him. Hmm. I want to ask you another YouTube question, kind of a different vein. Um, is the left losing on YouTube? It depends what you mean by losing. I mean, there have been <laughs> studies done that compare this, the total audience size of the left versus right on YouTube, and there have been studies that compare the number of left-wing versus right-wing channels on YouTube, and uh, depending on how you measure it, you get a sort of different answer. I think that the, the most important thing is, without getting into the nitty-gritty of the numbers, corporate media it ha presents mostly a corporatist, sensationalist point of view. So even whether you're talking about CNN or MSNBC, that MSNBC editorially takes more of a center-left position, the primary sort of filter is ratings and profit. And just having an alternative to that on YouTube uh, is a really great thing for the left, even if they are 5% behind or 5% ahead of the right on YouTube. I actually don't know the answer as to who is winning because who is winning depends on what it is that you're measuring, but there's no question that the big YouTube channels have presented a really valuable alternative to the sort of centrist corporatist uh, um, line that we get on most corporate media. And then of course you have Fox News, which is a different approach altogether. And, and I think that comment applies to the right as well. It's the YouTube perspective presented by the right is not centrist or corporatist. Um, I, you know, from what I've, I think you would know more about this than me, but from what I've seen, it's a more reactionary version of the right. And do you think that's the direction that the Republican Party will ultimately head in? Well, we've seen, if you go to the 2010 Tea Party movement, as a movement, it basically no longer exists because some elements of it just dissolved and some elements of it were integrated into the broader Republican Party. And now the Republican Party is slightly more Tea Party-esque than it was before 2010. And in the same way, I think you've seen some of that extreme conspiracy right uh, be integrated from the YouTube sphere and from alternative media. Uh, and so sometimes conspiracy theories make it on to Fox News. They have sort of bled over into that more corporate right-wing media narrative. I, as a progressive, I think it's extremely con uh, concerning. Uh, it'll be up to the people that are part of that movement to decide whether those are voices that they want to be heard uh, within mainstream conservatism. One thing I do find, though, interesting, David, and I'm curious for your perspective on this, you went on the Joe Rogan podcast. You, you've engaged with guys like Dave Rubin. I mean, they are frequently smeared in the New York Times and others as gateways to the alt-right. Do you think that that is a fair thing to say? Because as you said, as for as many people who may have been radicalized on YouTube, there may be as many people who've been de-radicalized on YouTube. Yeah, I think more people have been radicalized than de-radicalized. It's anecdotal, mm -hmm. but at least from, from the calls that I get, it seems that there's more, uh, there, there are many ways into being radi radicalized on YouTube, and it seems that the ways out uh, are, are fewer and, and further between. But I think there's no question that, you know, my approach has always been, I don't want unchallenged radical ideas on my program. If I interview someone who is an extremist right winger like white nationalist Richard Spencer, who is very tied in with the alt-right, for example, mm -hmm. I'm not going to provide a platform for his ideas to be stated unopposed. I will only take on those interviews if, number one, I believe that the ideas are prominent enough that they're worth challenging, but number two, that I'm the right person to challenge them. That's my approach, and I think you're alluding to some people that have a different approach. Hmm. What was that experience like on the Rogan podcast? That's like, <laughs> he gets so, such an insane yeah. audience. What has that been like for you? 
It's been great in terms of people learning about my program, and I've heard from many sort of center-right people who say, I don't really agree with a lot of your conclusions, but I appreciate you sort of being upfront in how you reach them, and that's a better way to engage on, on the ideas rather than uh, ad hominems and bad faith arguments. So, I mean, once you get there, it's just a two-hour conversation with another guy in a room, and it's sort of very informal and casual. Then you leave and you realize that he has this audience of millions, and everything you said is being analyzed, but it was a great experience. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, David. I had to get you on the show after we heard you there. Really interesting perspective. One of the most He's interesting lying. people it on YouTube. It was my idea. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having well, me. Thank really you, David. We yeah. appreciate it. Thanks, David. Thank you. A lot more rising after this.